Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pete Sauer, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the TCFG monthly technical seminar being broadcast off our beautiful Urbana campus here at the University of Illinois. And I'm very pleased to bring you today the dynamic duo, two of our faculty members, Alejandro Dominguez Garcia, who is in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. And I should say he's an MIT grad, and this is his first seminar, I think, to be given as an associate professor. That is correct. Congratulations to Alejandro for his recent promotion. <laughs> and we're truly a multidisciplinary group. We not only have power people working with cyber people, but in this case, uh, Grace Gao is also a mechanical engineer by degree, but she's in the Department of Aeronautical Engineering, and she has an ECE degree from Stanford. So what a, what a combination uh, Grace is. I think we're going to start with Alejandro, and the title is on GPS spoofing, uh, with the particular attention to phaser measurement units. Thank you, Pete. Alejandro. So today, we are going to talk about uh, some work uh, we've done uh, in the last three years on understanding what are potential vulnerabilities of uh, GPS-based timing, especially uh, for PMU applications. And this is uh, work the, that I've done with uh, Jonathan and uh, Graus, uh, um, Grace uh, joined uh, later on and you know, a few of our students. And then on the second part, she's going to be talking about uh, how do we actually avoid these uh, vulnerabilities uh, to make essentially a timing uh, resilient for this type of applications, okay? So I'm gonna get started essentially giving you some basics about how PMU uh, work, how PMUs work. I mean, this is pretty standard, so I'm just gonna go quick through it. And essentially, a PMU is nothing else than, you know, a sensor, and essentially that sensor is uh, measuring some uh, quantity in the physical uh, network, in the power network, under the assumption that it can be described by a sinusoid, okay? So essentially, uh, at the end of the day, what you get out of the PMU is a phasor. I mean, it's a phasor representation of that sinusoid. So you're gonna get a magnitude and an angle. So for example, if you are measuring voltage, you, get, you might get a voltage, a magnitude, and an angle. And um, of course, the angle, that you get for that phase for representation, in a sense, depends on when do you start uh, essentially counting time. I mean, it depends on the, on the time uh, reference. And uh, one feature of PMUs is that uh, you can actually make that uh, uh, time reference uh, be the same for uh, many PMUs dispersed across a, a wide uh, geographical area. So that's, what's, that's what makes uh, PMU technology interesting. And the way to do that uh, is uh, essentially via GPS. I mean, uh, PMUs uh, are equipped with a GPS uh, receiver, and that's how essentially they derive a common uh, time uh, for, for all, all the PMUs, okay? So that's, the, that's essentially the basics. Now, the motivation for uh, the work that I'm gonna be talking about is essentially to understand what happens if uh, some attacker uh, would uh, tamper essentially the signals that uh, a GPS receiver of a PMU is uh, obtaining from the satellites uh, so as essentially to modify the timing information and essentially make the receiver believe that uh, you know, it's measuring some other time so that would essentially result in the measurements across the, the system not being synchronized. So we were trying to understand whether or not that was uh, possible and and what would be the implications, uh, et cetera. So all the work that I'm gonna be reporting on is mostly uh, essentially on how we formulated the, the, this type of attack, some simulation results, but it turns out that uh, there is a group uh, out there that have been able to demonstrate these um, types of attacks in actual uh, receivers. Uh, so, so essentially, that's, uh, this is this, that's the summary of the, what I'm going to be talking about. Essentially, tell you, uh, uh, you know, that uh, show you that these uh, types of attacks are, are possible and that they can cause significant uh, phases uh, errors in the measurements uh, provided. Okay. Now, 
Uh, just to make sure we are on the same page and uh, it's important that we understand uh, this, okay, before I talk of all the things that I'm going to be talking uh, about. Um, yes, this might be an issue uh, in years to come. I mean, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, it, you know, it's, it, it might be a problem, but the truth is that the PMUs are not really used today for uh, real-time closed-loop uh, control applications. So they are not used in AGC, they are not used for the most part, uh, as I understand, in things like state estimation, etc. So they, they are really there just collecting data and they have been used, um, you know, for post-mortem analysis and so on. But uh, the point is that, uh, you know, if you were to, you know, to attack a PMU today with uh, the things that we are talking about today, it wouldn't have, it, it would not have no impact on real-time operations of the system, okay? So that's important. So, 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 okay. So let me tell you then a little bit of um, the basics of um, how a GPS receiver essentially obtains time and also the position. Uh, and then, you know, once, uh, once uh, you understand uh, how that works, I'll tell you how, how you know, you could formulate uh, an attack that would essentially change the timing information that the uh, PMU would receive through the GPS. So essentially, GPS receiver, what it does is determines uh, the, the, the distance uh, to a satellite by estimating the, the, the time it takes the signal to, to travel from the satellite to the receiver, and then if you multiply that by the speed of light, you get an estimate on how far is the, the satellite, okay? So, so essentially, if you have um, satellite positions and ranges, you, you should be able to obtain the position of the GPS receiver, which is mostly what uh, we understand or what we use GPS uh, today to, to, to know where we are, but you could actually derive uh, time from, from it, okay? So how does uh, that work? Well, if the, essentially the, 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 the satellite, the, the GPS satellite has some uh, clock, okay? And uh, essentially it's uh, broadcasting information uh, with the, the, the time at which that uh, uh, information has been broadcasted, okay? And uh, if the receiver uh, would be perfectly synchronized, meaning the clock of the receiver would be perfectly synchronized, then the, the time it, it would take the signal to travel from the, the, the satellite to the receiver it would be just the difference between what the, the receiver re, uh, records as the arrival time minus whatever it was, the, the time it was uh, sent. The problem with that is that um, there is the, you know, those two clocks are not synchronized a priori, okay? So there is, a, there is essentially a, a clock offset between those. So if the, if the receiver were to do that, then it wouldn't get the correct uh, time. So it, it, essentially what the receiver is going to do is correct for that, uh, for that uh, clock offset, okay? So a couple of other things that are important. When a GPS receiver of a PMU essentially stamps uh, a measurement, uh, it uses a coordinated universal time, which is a slightly offset uh, uh, from the GPS time, so it's 16 seconds, so whatever time you are getting in UTC, that's not actually GPS uh, time, but that's just like a, you know, a 16 second correction, so it's not a, it's not a big uh, deal, but I mean, this is important for you to understand that these two times are not, uh, are not the same. Now, let me tell you then now how essentially a GPS receiver would uh, determine its position and that clock offset that I told you about, okay? So uh, in equation three, what we have is essentially the relation uh, between what we refer as the pseudo range, the true range of the, of the satellite and essentially this clock offset. So what that equation is saying is that uh, if the, if the receiver were to take the, the time at which it received the signal, okay, as measured by itself, and the time at which it was sent as encoded in the signal and multiplied by the, by the speed of light, then it gets the pseudo range. And that's not actu the actual range because of the clock offset that I talked about. But what the equation three is saying is that uh, you can relate back that to the true range, which are, times the, the, the difference uh, between those, which is essentially the speed of light times this clock offset that, that the, the receiver wants to compute. And then the true range is just the uh, equation four. So you take essentially the vector uh, for which uh, that gives you the position of the satellite and subtract it from the uh, GPS receiver vector position, which you don't know a priori, and that gives you the, the range, okay? So, 
Uh, essentially, here it's important uh, to pay attention to how the satellite, sorry, how the receiver is going to compute uh, the position of the satellite, which is through a, a set of uh, parameters called the ephemerides, and that's encoded, those are uh, parameters encoded in the signal that the uh, satellite is broadcasting. And I'll go back to these ephemerides because that's actually uh, uh, how we are going to formulate the attack. We are going to modify those ephemerides, but I'll get back to, to that in just a couple of seconds. So, so anyway, so the, the bottom line is that uh, if a, a GPS receiver is getting uh, signals from four satellites, okay, which are uh, somewhere up there, okay, so then uh, essentially it would be able to solve for the four unknowns that we have between uh, these uh, two equations. The position of the GPS receiver as determined by XU, YU, and CU, that, that's the position, and this clock offset that would essentially uh, allow the GPS to obtain, uh, sorry, the GPS receiver to obtain uh, the, the, the clock of the, uh, of the satellites, okay? And that's essentially how they synchronize. So four satellites would, uh, would give you enough, um, enough equations and then you solve for those unknowns and that's that. Now in reality, you have more than four satellites uh, visible, okay? And that's also desirable in terms of, um, you know, avoiding uh, you know, problems in the calculation or noise in the measurements or, or whatever. So essentially what the GPS receiver would do at that point is obtain the position and the clock uh, error by uh, solving a um, least square errors estimation problem, which is what, uh, what I, I have in, the, in there in the slide. So once you do that, as I said, you get the position x u, y u, and z u, and then the clock offset uh, t u. Now, uh, PMUs, they don't care about X, U, Y, U, Z, U to a certain extent. They are static, so they know where they are, right? So, so that's that. So what PMUs care about uh, is essentially T, U. Now, I have my iPhone in my hand. When we use the iPhone essentially to navigate throughout, what we care is X, U, Y, U, and Z, U. We don't really care about uh, T, U, okay? With PMUs, it's different. They don't care about the position because they know where, where they are. Uh, but what they care is the, the, the time synchronization error. Okay, so, and that's essentially what, um, what we are going to be altering with the, with the or, 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 or trying to show how it can be altered. Now, let's go back to what I said earlier about the, the, how the, essentially the, the receiver actually computes the position of the satellites, okay? Remember that it enters the, those two equations that I showed earlier, okay? So X, uh, Y, Y, uh, I, and Z, I, the GPS receiver needs to be able to obtain those from the, from the data uh, in the signal uh, broadcasted by the satellite, okay? So it's gonna do that uh, through the so-called ephemerides that I said, uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, what are those? Well, let me first introduce what uh, we refer to as uh, Keplerian elements. And uh, essentially, the Keplerian ele elements are nothing else than uh, six integration constants. Integration constants of what? Well, uh, essentially, uh, uh, if you want to determine the, the, the position of a satellite, you could solve a differential uh, equation that would tell you the trajectory of the satellite over time. So those six integration constants has to do with the initial conditions of the, where the satellites uh, were. And once you have those, you have essentially the uh, differential equation that tells you how the trajectory of the, of the satellite is gonna evolve. So you can get the position of the satellite at any point in, in time. Now, uh, those Keplerian ele elements uh, are essentially for the case where you are only assuming that the, the the only force on the satellite is just Earth gravitational force, okay? Now, in reality, you have more forces acting on the satellite. You have the force of the sun, you have the uh, force of the moon, uh, tidal wave forces and all that, so it becomes a multi-body problem, okay? Now, uh, in that case, you can no longer uh, determine the trajectory of the satellite uh, uh, with the method that I just said. I mean, it's not enough to have just the Keplerian elements because essentially you can think of those as changing over, over time, okay? So, so it turns out that um, what, uh, what you do in that case is 
you can augment that uh, set of Keplerian elements with a bunch of other information in what we refer to as the satellite ephemerides, okay? And that's really what's going to allow you to obtain the position of the satellite. And that's essentially the a signal that the, the, the satellite is, is broadcasting, the GPS receiver is getting, it decodes the information, and that's how it determines the position of the satellite at a, any given a point in time. And uh, just want to say one more thing about the ephemera is that those are essentially uploaded from, from ground every two hours, okay, from the, from the ground segment of the GPS infrastructure, okay? And as I said, that's essentially the information that the receiver is using to determine the position of the satellites. Now, now that we have the basics of how uh, essentially a GPS receiver works and the information that it uh, receives from the satellites, how it's decoded, all the ideas uh, that I talked about, the Keplerian elements, uh, ephemeris and all that, let me tell you essentially how does this attack look like. So essentially what, uh, what you could do the, is the following. The objective, uh, if you want to inflict as much uh, damage on the timing of the satellite, you could formulate the problem as an optimization program in which what you are trying to do is maximize the difference between the PMU's receiver clock offset before and after the attack. So if you maximize that, then essentially whatever clock uh, that the, 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 G, the GPS receiver is getting is going to be, be offset by a maximum amount, okay? So, so then essentially you perform that optimization for some instant in time, and then essentially you implement the spoof, the, the spoofing attack. So what are the decision variables in that optimization program? And uh, you know, I essentially had earlier like one slide with just a bunch of equations and an optimization and so on, but I replaced that with uh, words, uh, which I think it's easier to understand. So what are the, the, the decision variables in that optimization program? Well, the ephemerides, okay, that's part of the signal that the satellite is broadcasting, the pseudo ranges and the receiver uh, coordinates, okay? So those are essentially the, the, the decision variables. So you are gonna try to determine what uh, those uh, variables should look like to essentially maximize this uh, uh, difference between the pre and post attack the clock uh, offset, okay? And then the optimization has also a bunch of uh, additional constraints uh, on the values uh, uh, of uh, the, the difference of the values the pre, the, between the pre and post attack ephemeris and so on and so forth uh, that ensure that essentially if there is some uh, detection scheme, it's captured by that. So we're trying to essentially uh, figure out what's the worst possible scenario in terms of an attack, okay? So, so that's essentially the, the idea of the attack. I mean, we have the, you know, the formulation of in that uh, transactions paper that appeared on the first slide. So if you are curious about the math and so on, you can read uh, there how it, uh, how it works, okay? So now, um, essentially, how does that uh, time synchronization error translates into the phase information provided uh, by a PMU? It's essentially what uh, you have there in equation six. So you take the pre and post uh, attack the time synchronization error, multiply by 60, and so on, and that's essentially how much uh, error you are gonna get in the phase information provided by the PMU, okay? So that's uh, that. Now let me show you a couple of uh, simulations where we implemented this, um, this type of uh, attack, and uh, here you can see what happens with the phase information provided by the PMUs. So, so essentially, uh, you have on the right-hand side that um, uh, the, um, the, the time synchronization error uh, goes from zero to about 22 uh, milliseconds, and that essentially results in a 44 uh, angle difference between the pre and post attack. So that's how much error you can induce in the phase information when you, are, you, when you only have like four satellites visible. And on the left hand side, actually, you can see that the, the position of the, of the receiver doesn't change much, about five meters and so on, because if it were to change by a large quantity, say 100 meters or a kilometer, then it's very easy to detect that that uh, attack has occurred. I mean, the PMU has not wheels, right? So it's not gonna be moving around, as you can imagine. And uh, in this slide, it's uh, essentially something similar, but for the case, where you have more than four satellites, seven satellites in this uh, case, so you, you can still say that there is a large uh, change in the phase information. Okay, so let me finish here and hand it over to Grace. Uh, so essentially I talk a little bit about uh, one possible way to essentially spoof 
the time provided by a GPS receiver uh, utilizing PMU applications. And uh, you know you can implement the attack in for any num number of satellites. Uh, but uh, you know one message that I want you to take home is uh, don't panic. Okay. So PMUs are mostly used today for monitoring. We are doing these studies because we are trying to understand what would happen if these types of attacks were implemented and and these PMUs were utilized uh, in real time control applications, etc. Which is not the case today. Okay. So with that, I'm going to close and hand it over to Grace. Okay, thanks. Okay, it's my turn. So Alejandro just uh, told us that we want to use GPS-based timing for PMUs, yet currently the GPS-based timing is vulnerable of being spoofed. So uh, for my part, I would like to invite all of you to think with me and think about, okay, there's a risk. How can we mitigate such a risk? Are there any solutions? Yes, so we want to know how to make GPS-based timing robust. Before I want to get the answers from you, or before I provide the answers, some solutions, let's first look at the facts about GPS. We already know that uh, um, GPS provides a lot of timing for many solutions including for our situation, the PMUs. Whenever we think about the robustness of security, I think the immediate answer would be, can we encrypt the signal? However, the fact is that the GPS signals are unencrypted, unfortunately. Only the GPS military signals are, are, are encrypted. So therefore, the civil receivers, including PMUs, do not have access to the encrypted military code. What's more, the GPS civil signals are completely open. All the signal structure um, definition has been published to the uh, publicly available ICDs, which is the interface control documents. So in terms of, okay, now GPS signals are not encrypted. Can we add encryption to that? Another fact is that the current GPS system is operational. It has uh, 30, about 31 satellites. They're already in orbits, about uh, over 20,000 miles away, uh, 20,000 kilometers away from us. And then just give you the fact, it takes about $40 million to build a GPS satellite and about $100 million to launch a GPS satellite. So there's almost no control from the receiver side that we cannot put encryption on the already in orbit, already operational GPS satellites. So what we can do is just the receivers, which have the unencrypted signals, and all the signal structure is open. And there's another fact, is that uh, the received GPS signals are extremely weak. As I mentioned that the GPS satellites are over 20,000 kilometers away from us, and then can you guess how much will be the received signal power? I see some students who are taking my GPS class, I guess they should know. So the received uh, GPS signal power is as weak as 10 to minus 16 watts. It's just that weak. So any ideas about how we can mitigate the, the risk of, uh, of GPS signals being spoofed? So here I'm going to provide two solutions. The first solution is, about, uh, is called the GPS cooperative authentication. So the idea is that a spoofer is often local. So when we look at the legitimate signals from uh, uh, GPS satellites, the satellites are all above us, over 20,000 kilometers away above us. But the spoofers are often local. They are not transmitting from uh, a space vehicle of that high altitude. So we want to leverage this and then to have uh, the network and then the geographical redundancy. That means, you know, it's maybe it's hard to, to, to make one GPS receiver robust, but what if we have a network of GPS receivers and they can all help each other and cross-check with each other? Then a spoofer here um, in Champaign, Illinois, is very unlikely to spoof 
another receiver, say, in San Francisco, California. Then we can have the, the San Francisco receiver and cross-check with our champagne receiver, see if all their signals match or not. And then there are uh, different ways to check in whether the signals match or not. And then here uh, we use uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the military PY code to do cross-checking. Although as a civil receiver that is used in PMUs, we do not have access to the military code. But if we have two snippets of signals, one from Champaign, Illinois, one from San Francisco, California, then we just cross-correlate the quadrature channel of the PY code. Then if this, this code exists, then we should see a correlation, even if we do not know the exact uh, code bits of the PY code. So that is the idea. And then the first step of this uh, cooperative GNSS uh, authentication is to do the pairwise check. As I mentioned, it's just like the cross-correlating of the quadrature channel of the two receivers at different locations. And then here I list uh, um, uh, the receive signal, and then I won't go through details, but I just want to let you know that the receive signal contains uh, the civil uh, code, which is called CA code in the in-phase channel, uh, the PY code, which is the encrypted military code in the quadrature channel, and then all the signals associated with time delay Doppler frequency offset and phase offset. What we want to do is we, we try to align the phase offset, align the time delay, compensate the Doppler frequency, and then uh, we correlate in the quarter channel. So this is the ideal case uh, when we uh, do the pairwise check. Uh, in the in-phase channel, we see this triangle shape of uh, 40 correlation peaks space one millisecond apart. And this is because uh, the GPS, the civil signal, the CA code is one millisecond long, and then every navigation bit is uh, 20 milliseconds. That's why you see this 40 milliseconds length, uh, uh, duration of the triangle and with all these correlation peaks one millisecond apart. That's for the in-phase channel. And if you look at the quadrature channel, if uh, the, uh, the receivers are not spoof, then there should be uh, uh, the military code, then we should expect to have a single correlation peak as shown in the um, lower left figure. However, what if the signal is spoofed? If a signal is spoofed, then the spoofer will try to counterfeit uh, the signals, uh, especially the CA signals, um, uh, CA civil signals. Then in the in-phase channel, we should expect to see something very similar to the case when it's not spoofed. However, since the spoofer does not have access to the encrypted uh, PY code, therefore in the quadrature channel, there should be no correlation peak. And then uh, to, de uh, to decide whether the um, signal is spoofed or not, we just check if, if uh, there is a correlation peak or not in the quadrature channel. And then we can set the threshold and then from there, we can model our uh, pairwise check as these two uh, Gaussian functions. And then here, uh, the blue uh, shaded area is the false alarm rate, and then the red shaded area is uh, uh, the misdetection rate. And then with that, we also uh, conducted some experiments with uh, different scenarios. First, we uh, um, put one receiver in Champaign, Illinois, actually on top of uh, our Avery lab, and then we have another receiver in San Francisco, California. Although these two receivers are far apart, they can both see the same subset of the GPS satellites, and we can use that for cross-checking. And then uh, for this case, uh, the San Francisco case is also in a very GPS challenge environment because it's in downtown San Francisco, so there's a lot of multi-pass and a lot of errors. So we will later show that even in this really GPS challenge environment, we are still able to, to demonstrate this uh, spoofing test. And then uh, we also did another set of experiments in uh, 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 RAN2, Illinois. Um, and then for that, we put a GPS receiver on a moving car just to, to see if this also works in a, in a dynamic scenario. So again, some more uh, photos of, uh, of our experiment set up. As you can see, that in San Francisco, we, 
we put the receiver here is next to some tall buildings. And then uh, here I also want to mention that uh, for the GPS receiver, the GPS front end, uh, we just used a very inexpensive off-the-shelf uh, GPS front end, which is called the, the SIG sampler. So here is our pairwise uh, result. And then uh, the left column is uh, the San Francisco and Champaign data, which uh, they are, uh, the two receivers are 3,000 kilometers apart. And then uh, the right column is the run two and, and Champagne data, the receivers are 22 kilometers apart. And as we expected, if we zoom in, uh, if we look at the, the bottom two figures, they just look very similar to the ideal case. Again, in the in-phase channel, um, we see this triangle shape of uh, 40 uh, correlation peaks. And then in the uh, quadrature channel, uh, we see one correlation peak centered uh, uh, at uh, the center of the CA code correlation peak. So from there, we also um, analyze uh, the SNR effects for our pairwise check performance. And then here I plot the left figure is for the San Francisco and, and Champagne data. Uh, the X axis is uh, the probability of false alarm. And then the y-axis is the probability of misdetection. And then we can see uh, the different curves with respect to different uh, signal-to-noise ratio and then also the correlation window. And then the right figure is um, the same thing, but for our run two and champagne data. OK, so that's the pairwise check. Once we get the pairwise check, we need to do the decision aggregation. And then remember, we want to do the cross-checking with multiple such cooperative receivers. So here, we take into account that not only we do the cross-correlation with the cross-check receivers, but also we do not assume that all the cross-check receivers are accurate or reliable. So we model in the way that we take into account sometimes uh, the cross-check receivers can be spoofed uh, by a, a different spoofer with the probability uh, PSD as a spoofed by a different spoofer. Sometimes uh, the cross-track receivers can be spoofed even by the same spoofer with the probability of PSS, that means spoofed by the same spoofer. And then the rest of the time, uh, the cross-track receivers uh, are authentic. And I won't go through all the details about mass, but I just want to let you know the, the key result. So the key result is that our uh, false alarm rate, the aggregated false alarm rate and then the aggregated misdetection rate can be bounded by this exponential. And in this exponential, we have n. Uh, n is the number of cross-check receivers. Somehow this mouse, OK. So n is the number of cross-check receivers, and then uh, it's also related to a parameter lambda. And then the lambda is a function of alpha, which is the pairwise false alarm rate, and then beta, which is the pairwise misdetection rate. At the same time, it's a function of the PSD, probability of being spoofed by a different spoofer, and PSS, which is the probability of being spoofed by the same spoofer. So from this equation, these two equations, I want you to take, have a two takeaway message. One is really nice that we have n in this exponential term. That means our authentication performance, the probability of false alarm and misdetection, it improves exponentially with uh, the increasing number of cross-check receivers. At the same time, because there's a, a two in front of PSS, it shows that uh, the probability that uh, a cross-check receiver is being spoofed by the same spoofer causes twice as great performance compared to the PSD, uh, the probability of uh, the cross-check receiver being spoofed by a different spoofer. So we further plotted the receiver operating characteristic curve or the rock curve, and then uh, the live figure is the case that we just assume all the cross-check receivers are reliable. And then the right curve, uh, right figure, we assume that uh, 
uh, uh, uh, some receivers uh, being spoofed. And then here we have a very, very uh, challenging assumption, or even conservative cons assumption, that the probability of the receiver being spoofed by the same spoofer is 10%, and then the probability that uh, the receiver is spoofed by a, a, a different spoofer is also 10%. And then here we also plot, if you can see that the star is uh, um, the performance from one reliable high quality reference receiver. And then in this ROC curve, we would like the performance to be on the upper left corner. And then we show that, look, like even we don't need a large number of cross-check receivers. When N is eight, if we have just eight Cross -check, uh, uh, eight um, number of cross-check receivers, all low quality receivers, the performance can exceed the performance from one reliable um, high quality reference receiver. And then I further plot this, uh, 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 further plot the, the probability of misdetection over the x-axis, which is uh, uh, the number of cross-check receivers, and also probability of the false alarm uh, over the number of uh, cross-check receivers. And then uh, note that this is in the, the log scale, so we see that these curves are almost linear, so that further proof that uh, our uh, uh, performance, authentication performance, increase linearly, uh, increase uh, exponentially with the number of cross-check receivers. And again, in this curve, we only need, we don't need a lot. We don't need like hundreds, thousands, millions of cross-check receivers, only a small number, of, a handful number of uh, cross-check receivers, even if some of them are unreliable and some of them can be spoofed by uh, spoofers, that would give us uh, a, a performance that on par with a reliable cross-check receiver. So, um, this is uh, one um, approach we did towards the goal of uh, robust GPS-based timing for PMUs. Another approach we did was to take advantage, we, we tried to think about what is something specific about PMUs compared to regular GPS receivers. For PMUs, as Alejandro mentioned, that the PMUs are static. Right, normally for a regular GPS, we care about the positions. We care about X, Y, Z, and we don't care that much about the time. But, but for PMUs, it's the opposite. We care about the time, and then we don't quite care about the, the locations, the, the X, Y, Z. And as a matter of fact, we, we can use X, Y, Z as our prior information. We already know where the receivers are. We can survey the receivers. So along that line, and then we also propose uh, the position information aided vector tracking. So the idea is that we use the vector tracking. We try to link all the each individual channels of the GPS receiver, and plus we want to reduce the search space. You know, we don't need the four-dimensional search space anymore. We don't need X, Y, Z. We only need a T. And then so we can aid the search space by the true position, and by reducing the search space, we increase the redundancy. And what's more, uh, we use common filtering and, and further, uh, and also the narrowband loop filter to, uh, to further take advantage of uh, the fact that the PM uses static. So before I talk to you, uh, I presented our, uh, uh, before I present our approach, let's uh, first look at the, how it works in the current uh, GPS receiver, or the traditional way, uh, which is called scalar tracking. For scalar tracking, we have a bunch of channels, and each channel means the, um, the measurements with respect to each satellite. And then once we know the pseudo range measurements with respect to each satellite, we have the navigation processing, which takes into account the ephemeris data, and we do the trial iteration. And then we get the position and time in four dimensional domain, which is X, Y, Z, and T. But for our uh, position information aided vector tracking, it, it looks more complicated because we first, we take advantage of the known true position X, Y, Z. And then we feed back this true position back to each channel. And then we use this uh, true re known uh, receiver position to aid each individual channels. 
by feeding back this information, we actually link all the individual channels together and let them work together. And at the same time, we use the common filter and then, uh, uh, and then the narrow band uh, 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 filter loop so that we can uh, further reduce uh, uh, the noise and then uh, take advantage that the receivers are static. And then again, I won't go through too much of the details. So this is our common filter and then how we calculate the receiver clock bias. But I would like to uh, mainly show you our result. So here for this figure, it is uh, our result for the, the normal case. And then the red curve is our position information aided vector tracking. And then uh, the blue curve is uh, um, the traditional GPS scalar tracking. As we can see that our position information aided vector tracking provides uh, a lot of uh, better uh, accuracy. Uh, it's actually about uh, 15 nanoseconds of timing accuracy versus uh, the 50 nanoseconds. And then this is a, a normal case and then we have the nine, uh, nine satellites in view. Because we want to test the robustness of this approach uh, over over jamming or over additional noise. So we just purposely injected more and more noise and see how much is the noise tolerance of the traditional uh, scalar tracking and our uh, proposed uh, position information aided vector tracking. And then, uh, so as we can see that if we slowly increase the noise, for traditional receivers, if we, just for the regular case, we see nice satellites. And then as we slowly increase noise, 1 dB to 3 dB to 4 dB, when it's 4 dB, the traditional uh, um, uh, scalar tracking can only see four satellites in view. And that's actually the minimum required number of satellites in view for uh, providing the navigation solutions, including position and time. So here we can see that this left figure is when we add 1 dB noise, and then the right figure is like when we add 4 dB noise. And throughout the, all the noise adding, um, the, whole time, uh, the whole time, uh, our position uh, information aided uh, vector tracking outperforms uh, the uh, traditional vac uh, scalar tracking. And then the interesting hap thing happens when we try to add more noise, more than 5 dBs. When we add uh, noise more than 5 dBs, the traditional scalar tracking sees less than, fewer than four satellites, and then therefore does not give any uh, 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 navigation solutions anymore. Therefore, in these two figures, you, the blue curves disappear. And then we only see the red curves, and then that shows that, that our position information aided vector tracking can still perform, can still um, continue to, to give the timing information. And then it has about 5 dB more of noise tolerance compared to the scalar tracking. And in addition to the more tolerance of noise and um, uh, potential jamming attacks, it has another feature. The position information aided tracking uh, can detect meekening attacks. Uh, meekening means record and replay. Because uh, there's one type of attack, if a spoofer wants to pretend to be a receiver at a different position or like a, a different time, attacker will just record the legitimate GPS signals and then try to rebroadcast it later, like with a delayed time, and pretending this is the legitimate signal. So for a meekening attack, the idea is that um, uh, because for our position information aided tracking, we always have the known uh, 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 PMU position to feedback to the loop. So uh, therefore, if you have this record replay attack, and then the position will mismatch, and that will cause our uh, vector tracking uh, not converge, and then we can de uh, de detect that attack. And then this figure shows that we actually uh, simulated the meekening attack at this time, and then all of a sudden, boom, the, our uh, vector tracking is not working anymore. And once you see that our vector tracking is not working, that shows that there must be something go wrong, and then you shouldn't trust the, uh, the signals anymore. So uh, to conclude my talk, for my part, uh, we provided uh, two solutions uh, 
for uh, secure and robust GPS-based timing for PMUs. Uh, the first uh, approach is uh, the GPS cooperative authentication. For that, we try to leverage uh, uh, the uh, network and geographical redundancy over a network of cooperative GPS receivers. And we show that we only need a modest number of low uh, reliable cross-check receivers and that uh, network of low cost, not even not so reliable cross-check receivers can outperform uh, a high quality reliable receiver. And we also show that the robustness grows exponentially with the number of cross-check receivers. And then uh, the second solution, second approach I presented is the position information aided uh, uh, vector tracking. And then we show that it's robust against jamming because it can tolerate 5 dB more of noise compared to the traditional scalar tracking. And then uh, it can also uh, successfully detect meekening attacks and it even improves the accuracy of the timing solutions. And then, uh, so I would like to end my talk by acknowledging uh, my colleague, <laughs> it's uh, uh, Professor Jonathan Makla. So we, uh, it's, it's very nice, like we have a team and then it's nice to be on this team. And then we also, I also like to acknowledge TCG and here I list the references and then some of the work are done by Daniel Cho sitting in the audience. He's my graduate student and founded by TCG. And some of them are by my uh, previous postdoc, Liang Heng, and he was also partially founded by TCG. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Grace. We have a few minutes for questions if uh, anyone is curious. Grace? Tim. Um, so Tim Yardley, Illinois. Uh, if I noticed in the in the first defense mechanism that you had, there was a false positive rate associated with non-spoofed attacks. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, how the cross correlation may may result in false alarms there? Right. Oh, it was alarm. that chart. No, yeah, no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, go, so, go like, back uh, this is this is the case, right? What what if if so? What we want to see if there's a correlation peak in the quadrature channel. And then, so we want to detect this correlation peak to see if it exists. Uh, sometimes, if there's too much noise, see that this peak is, is, is above the noise floor. If it's too much noise and this peak can be buried in noise, and, and then maybe the peak is there, it's just you couldn't see because too much noise, and that would give you the false alarm. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. So what are the conditions under which you would see, say, too much noise? Is that a weak GPS signal? Yes, is that... that's the weak GPS signal. So I have it here. So it's related to the C, uh, the signal to noise ratio, the C over and that. And then this is actually also related to the, your, uh, the, the correlation window. So how long of the data snippets you would use to, to perform the cross correlation. Thank you. Question from online. What is a deployment strategy for the uh, cross? Cross checking. Uh, right. Like, yeah. Uh, how far apart? That's actually a very good question. Uh, uh, actually, it's not nice to be too close by because there's a Doppler leakage issue. Um, and then we actually test it. If we have two antennas, uh, both on every lab, but at like a like a two two different locations, both on the roof, then there will be too much interference from other satellites, and then you wouldn't be able to see the correlation peak. And then uh, Daniel had the uh, had the figures that uh, is if we assume like a one one uh, millisecond. Oh no, a uh, hundred millis second of uh, integration time, then the minimum uh, separation distance should be five kilometers. Something like that. Rosberg? I have a question about the per system uh, satellite. Uh, my question is mostly technical, mm -hmm. in the sense that I believe it should be real time. If I have a DPS here in Champagne, I get the signal on my PMU, and then at the same time, I want to compare this with the signal coming from Francisco or Rantoul. How do I get the signal from uh, Rantoul or 
Francisco is one more time a DPS. Is it a TCPIP? Uh, my question is, we can't have a duplicate system for any PMU within a region. Can we have, for example, some radius within we can have a PMU tester? That's a question I'm asking myself, if you can help me. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand your question correctly. So are you asking that uh, if you want to do the cross check and then uh, what kind of protocol you, we will need in terms of communicating the data snippets? Yeah, the, the, the protocol in a way to get the far signal, like the signal from Francisco or uh, Rantoul. What you would like to get the San Francisco PMU data? Yeah, how do I time? get this? Uh, do I get this one more time through satellite or do I get this through optic fiber line, whatever it is on the ground? Um, so, so this is a like a. Of course, you can you can check everything like a post processing. So if you have a little bit of communication delay, so it just uh, so that it just causes your uh, spoofing detection a little bit delayed. But you actually want the San Francisco data, so you would like them to transmit their measurement back up and then send it down here. Yes, so you would need the, the, the San Francisco PMU to transmit a, a small snippet of their GPS data to you. Yeah, Carl. For your technique, which do you think, for the PMUs, which yeah. do you think is worse, a false negative or a false positive? Oh, it's a hard question. I, 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 Did you have time to do some analysis on that to try to, you know, come So up with a uh, you're asking about the, the, uh, the false alarm or misdetection yeah. in terms of like uh, causing the actual... How, how, how should we balance them? In other words, equal balance? Maybe one is worse than the other? What do you think? Yeah, th th this is a very good question. And then this is actually, it's, it's uh, based on the requirement from from the power system, the monitoring of the power system. And then we just feel very lucky that TCG has the test bed, and then we have that on our schedule. Actually, Daniel is going to like, use our TCG simulator and the test bed to test like, for different settings of the parameters, how to balance this, and what will be the effect for the, for the power system. But, but it's not exactly a technical question. It's, uh, so for example, if you have false alarms, it may result in unnecessary disruption of the power grid. Whereas if you miss the detection, an important attack may be missed until it's too late. And yeah. So I don't think you can just sit in the lab and test this. This has to be something in terms of the kind of business objectives of the power grid that you would need to take the balance. Yeah, 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 that's right. Carl, I, totally I would agree. say as far as the grid goes today, it probably wouldn't make a difference. Because they don't care about the PMUs enough to make any difference. <laughs> the, the applications are still uh, rather experimental in, in nature, and the importance of the measurements and the importance of the timestamp, uh, as far as post-mortem analysis, w would cause some trouble, but I don't think it would cause any operational problems today. Yeah, although obviously you need to project forward to a point at which the PMUs are playing a critical role, and then ask which is the greater danger, that That's you'll right. miss a malicious attack or that you'll disrupt ordinary operations with false alarms. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would think that um, if, and uh, I'm going to make emphasis on that, if you were to use PMUs in any real-time control application, probably a, a, um, false alarms are more important in the sense that uh, if you think something is wrong, then you take it off the loop and use something else to make your decisions. Even if the information that is providing is correct, but uh, you think otherwise, you just take it out of the decision making. If you have like a, a misdetection, that means that you are gonna still be using the data to make decisions and that can be potentially very bad. So you can better tolerate false alarms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, several questions from online. How, and let me know if these have been already been answered. How are signals between receivers exchanged over a wide area? Yeah, so I think it's related to the previous question, right? Okay. So, yeah, it's, uh, it kind of, yeah. And can you disable the GPS by increasing the noise? Would that shut it down? 
So if you increase the noise, is is equal to a Jamie attack? Okay. Yeah. And then uh, is the additive Gaussian noise assumption for the GPS received signal reasonable? Um, so the jam, it, it, it depends on the jammer strategy, right? The jammers can, can jam the signal like uh, just by transmitting ID Gaussian noise. And this is just our assumption when we did the, the, uh, the simulation, the, the analysis. Frank Borth, Illinois. Uh, have you looked at the positive side of things? How uh, far separation do you think you're going to have, uh, say, on a utilities network to keep a spoofer from covering two or more GPS units? You know, how, how wide geographically do you think you can, or how narrow can you be and still have good uh, reliability of your system? Yeah, this is also a very good question. So how, how can a spoofer, so how can you like separate the, the, the receiver so that it doesn't get spoofed by the same spoofer? So this is related to the spoofer's transmitted power. So if the spoofer transmits high power of signal, it will cover a larger area. Uh, if the spoofer transmits like weaker signals, it won't cover that larger area. It, but the beauty of our like first approach, the cooperative authentication approach, is that we assume we even like you know the analysis. We even assume what if like a ten percent of the cross check receivers uh, spoofed by the same spoofer. So you can still leverage the redundancy from multiple receivers and the, the, the geographical network, and then to to handle that. Well, looking at the at just you know one high-powered receiver, wouldn't that be fairly easy to detect by having uh, you know exactly. it, the receivers would recognize that it was local? Yes, yes, exactly. So that's that also put the the spoofer at the risk of being. It, it would seem like the only way that you could do it, and a weakness of the system, because the GPS receivers are static. Yeah. They can be uh, hit by local receivers at the same time. Yes, that's right. So if you know where they are, it's a weakness. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Grace, a, a related question, uh, Tim Yardley, Illinois again. Um, have you looked, so this defense mechanism is on the receiver itself. Yeah. Right? Um, so implemented in software or hardware yeah. uh, to prevent it. Have, have you considered, a pet project of mine is to look at time diversity and using diverse time sources to um, pro provide ubiquitous time. Have you looked at combining this scheme with other potential time sources like IEEE 1588, um, maybe even as a mechanism to transfer the, the necessary information from you know, your, your remote location to your, to your more localized? Um, or, or cross-referencing against other sources and how that may affect your accuracy in, in terms of what you're looking at. Because you wouldn't be looking at necessarily the same parameters anymore, but instead the t relative time. Yeah, this is a great comment and I totally agree, agree with you. Okay, thank you again, Alejandro and Grace. Before we close, let me announce that our next Seminar is November the 7th. That's the first, I hope, the first Friday of the month of November, 1 p.m. Central Time here in beautiful Urbana. And then in December, December the 5th, I'm sorry, November the 7th is Andrew Wright, who is with uh, N Dimension Solutions. He will be speaking. And then on December 5th, which is the first Friday of, of December, 1 p.m., Central Time, we're pleased to have Edmund Schweitzer to be our speaker for that second seminar, that uh, last seminar of the fall. So thank you for joining us and we're adjourned.